All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the table. Welcome to those of you who um, have sat down at the table with me before. And welcome to any of you who are new. Um, I am continuing to do my readings on the archetypal structure of the beetles and what each each member in the band represents archetypally from uh, according to this deck called um, Archetypes by Kim Kress. So we're going to do Mr. McCartney today, guys. Uh, Mr. Number Nine himself. And I was going to try to do this on his birthday a couple weeks back, but ended up not being able to. So making up for lost time now. Yeah, so I mean, the cards have been pretty spot on um, with John and George so far. So let's see what they have to say about Mr. McCartney. Mm -hmm. What is Mr. McCartney's archetype? What was it in the Beatles? Okay. The self. The temple. Interesting. The king. Oh, wow. Okay. Let's keep going. The next two cards. The ocean. Again, we get the ocean. The prayer. Very, very interesting. Okay, and then last but not least, Gnosis, which is an initiation in this deck. Wow. Okay, guys, so for Mr. McCartney, we got the self, the temple, the king, the ocean, the prayer, and Gnosis. Fantastic. Let's take a look and see what the book has to say about Mr. McCartney's archetypal spread. All right, guys, so let's take a look at these cards for Mr. Paul McCartney. First card being the self. It says, the self is the prism that allows the spectrum of our personalities to radiate. It does not judge, prohibit, suppress, or oppress any of its parts, as it lovingly knows that all aspects have a time and a place, and leads us to experience the full breadth of life's offerings. The self is the central abiding container. The awareness of the infinite universe of possibilities. When this card appears, it's a call to step back into witness consciousness, to observe yourself navigating the world. Ask yourself, am I the stew or am I the chef? And in most situations, our ego draws us into the cauldron where we swirl, spin, and smolder in chaos. Yet the self is a graceful culinary dancer, watching, waiting, observing, as the spectrum of ingredients become the flavor of our life. Look in the mirror for 30 seconds or more. Attempt to see the you behind the you. Okay, and then the red on the left says, it's no surprise that two central mantras in the yogi tradition concern themselves with the self-experiment with soham, which means I am that, and 
Satnam, which means true identity. And the black on the right, if this card is perplexing for you, you are on the right track. It challenges us to expand our sense of identity beyond the little self. And the ego resists such movement. Wow. So appropriate, right? Okay, so when this card is light, it represents witnessing, accepting new aspects of the self. When it's dark, it represents being disjointed, fatigued, diffused of energy and purpose. Wow, that is just spot on with, with, you know, the struggle Paul had to go through um, concerning his identity and his legacy, right? Oh my gosh, that is just too amazing, too spot on. <laughs> it gets a little eerie sometimes, right? Okay, let's go to the next card, which is the temple. And the temple is the sanctuary, the shrine, or the altar. Okay, so when we think of the temple, we often envision an architectural structure in a far-off land. We are quick to distance ourselves from the sacred, assuming we must expend much effort in order to arrive there. Yet the temple is a universal and omnipresent energy, accessible in the highest and lowest, richest and poorest of places. Visiting the temple might be as simple as stepping in to the dappled light of the forest, slowly and sensuously kissing a lover, or closing your eyes to travel inward. This card is a call to re-examine what you pay homage to and what you reject. What do you spend your time worshiping? Would it be your phone, money, material goods? What barriers do you draw between yourself and the sacred? Very good question. Perhaps there is room on your altar for something new, something surprising. Offer it to the heavens. Wow. Okay, so in red on the left says the ancient yogis saw the body itself as the temple. Every function and feature of it as an expression of divinity. Build a shrine with found materials. Don't spend any money, only time. Okay, in black on the right. Though indeed the temple travels with you. This card is interwoven with the pilgrim archetype. If you've been longing for a spiritual journey, book your ticket. Yes. So when this card is light, it shows reverence for all and life as a sanctuary. When it's dark, it shows idolatry, cults, strict spirituality. <laughs> Very interesting. Um, idolatry and cults right and strict spirituality hmm something to kind of think about all right so the next card in the spread is that of the king and the king obviously represents the ruler the commander or the emperor if our lives are imagined as a kingdom containing the entire spectrum of human experience, the king presides over it all. Through the lens of the king, we assess the state of our land, make decisions, and rule accordingly. Therefore, the king must be thoroughly and regularly vetted so as to avoid corruption. Recognize the dual nature of the king. He is either seated in benevolence and strength, guiding you towards peace, or he is oppressing the weak out of a need to control. There is not much middle ground. 
Some think of the king as the ultimate expression of the ego. Yet the great kings of mythology and history serve from an egoless place. They take their throne with grace and humility, knowing the divine uses them as a channel to heal deep and long-standing discrepancies in the kingdom. Oh my goodness. <laughs> okay, so in black on the left, it says, once the king's relationship to divinity is broken or challenged, he often acts from a place of fear, scrambling to uphold his image and power. <laughs> so, so spot on with Paul and what he was going through, especially right before his death. Okay, and read on the right. <clears throat> the king is necessary. He is a bridge between the eternal and the day-to-day. -day. It is also said that it is necessary for the king to die. This is a death of the ego. Oh, my goodness. So when light, this card represents benevolence, divine leadership, service, or nobility. When it's dark, it represents oppression, a misuse of power, and corruption. Well, so far we are spot on with the first three. Okay, so the next card is a card that we pulled for John, and that is the ocean. So the ocean represents the unconscious, the depths, and the incomprehensible. The power of the ocean is unmatched. To step into its salty waters is to step into the unknown. By its sheer volume, the ocean represents the unconscious, all that is beyond our understanding. We cannot live within the ocean. We cannot claim it, manage it, or own it. It rejects our every attempt to dominate nature, yet amid its overwhelming power, it calls to us, inspires us, and invigorates our life on land. It dissolves the little us into the big us. When the energy of the ocean is present, there is change stirring that is beyond any change you've known before. The ego must dissolve. The saline swells work on your every very cells, your fibers, your deepest underlying beliefs. Like Aphrodite, we rise from the oceans, froth, a new being. Life is change. Let the wave crash. Wow. Okay, so in red on the left, the ocean displays every emotion without shame to witness its glassy moonlit surface and its unforgiving storms is to know the full spectrum of the human experience. In black on the right, study waves. Touch their surface. Get in the water. No matter where you live, each drop is a part of the whole. The ocean is in every tear. Okay, so when this card is light, represents uh, deeper than deep, big dreams or discovery. When it's dark, it is showing subsumed or drowned, you're polluted or unpredictable. Very interesting. It's the whole motion of the ocean of change, right? The change that is coming to put the ego away that goes hand in hand with the king. You know, the trying to find where your identity lies in the bigger scope of things, you know, and that's something that we're told time and time again that Paul dealt with, um, especially in the last few days of his life. So, 
Oh, very, very, uh, very heavy. Okay, so the next next card is the prayer. So the prayer represents the worship, the reverence, and the homage. What is prayer? When we are in a state of prayer, when are we in a state of prayer, and when are we not? To whom or what do we pray? Archetypally, the practice of prayer has been with us since the dawn of time as a remedy for the omnipresent self-centered thinking that spins us towards illusion. Prayer leads us beyond our ego as we move from our little story to the big one. Some say we are in a state of prayer anytime we are not at the center of our own thoughts. Others say prayer is a natural result of gratitude. Perhaps it is simply surrender or service. Whatever prayer is for you, this card reminds us of its importance. Get quiet, low, humble and soft. Bow and touch the ground as your heart lifts to the sky. Though it may be uncomfortable, it is time. Nothing else will do. (laughs) Oh my goodness, you guys. Heavy, heavy stuff. In red on the left, experiment with the act of bowing down. Nearly all the spiritual traditions make a practice of prostration. Okay, and then in black on the right, Every song, kiss, breath, word can become a prayer. It is a feeling, not an action. Consider the ancient mantra, Ang Namo Guru Dev Namo. I bow to the creative consciousness within. Bow to the teacher within. When this card is light, it is representative of offering oneself to be of service or asking for guidance. When it's dark, it shows expecting results and self-aggrandizement. Yes, so being overzealous and full of ego. Again, we're going back to the ego dissolving the ego and trying to forge your identity from an egoless place. So that's why I find the next and final card all the more fascinating because this is an an initiation card, Gnosis. And Gnosis represents the innermost knowing and mystic truths. True knowledge is not found in facts and figures and scholarly books on library shelves. Rather, Gnosis points to the deep and timeless archetypal wisdom that rises from the felt experience of having touched the unknown with every one of the senses. Those who are drawn to Gnosis find themselves in esoteric studies, likely involving mysticism, alchemy, healing, or perhaps science. Knowing is their calling. Not knowing is their job description. No matter how far the alchemists take their studies, they come to the ultimate conclusion that facts slip towards mystery, and soon the mystery results in facts. This card signifies a knowing that is life-changing. And once you experience it, you are forever changed and become a guardian of Gnosis. The eternal mystery is calling you. Study your passion in the deepest way available to you. (laughs) wow okay so in red on the left 
Those who say they know, don't. Those who say they don't know, know. <laughs> that reminds me of the interview um, with George Harrison in the International Times. He said something like that. He who doesn't speak doesn't know and he who speaks knows it all or he said something like that um okay so then in black on the right it says this card relates to the riddle and to the shapeshifter all concern themselves with revealing mystic truths wow so in light this card represents contemplating the mystery unanswerable questions when dark stands for over intellectualizing and literalizing asking others so wow guys what a spread for mr mccartney i'm pretty blown away by this you know we again got a spot on reading you know this whole reading was about Paul being the, I don't even know if you want to, it centers around his ego and how he lost his ego because he knew he was going to die. He had that mystic truth, right? That he was going to pass away very soon. And he had a lot of contemplating, a lot of um, literalizing and internalizing um, through the last, I don't know, couple of years of his life. So we start off with the self and we end with gnosis in this spread. And it's all centered around the disillusion of the ego. You know, um, Paul knew that he couldn't hold on to his ego anymore, you know, because he had to actually accept that someone else was going to step in for him and be him. So it's like, where, where is your ego when something like that happens? It's very, very, very tricky, slippery slope that he was on and these cards sure show that he was just always seeking answers. He was always trying to put others first and himself last, trying to figure out his purpose. I don't know. What do you guys think about this spread? Um, I find it super fascinating. Um, let me know what you guys think got from this reading. I'm very, very excited to see what your thoughts are on Mr. Paul McCartney's archetypal reading. Let me know. And next up, we're going to say hello to our lovely friend Ringo. Yes, we're going to do a reading for Ringo and see where he lies in all of this, this business with the Beatles. So, Again, thank you guys for watching. If you're here with me till the end, as always, it's a pleasure and I will see you in the next video. Bye.